You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Let us pray. God of all glory, on this first day you began creation, bringing light out of darkness. On this first day you began your new creation, raising Jesus Christ out of the darkness of death. On this Lord's Day, grant that we, the people you create by water and the Spirit, may be joined with all your works in praising you for your great glory. Through Jesus Christ, in union with the Holy Spirit, we rejoice, having been baptized into the family of God. In service to you, may we be a people with whom you are well pleased. Amen. Now hear the call to worship, to, to confession. A prophet appeared in the wilderness, calling the people to repent, be baptized, and prepare the way of the Lord. We return to the water to confess our sins, giving thanks for the grace of Jesus Christ, the one who has come to save us. Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in your order of worship. God of all glory, you look from heaven and see us as we are not worthy to kneel at your feet, not ready to welcome your way. Forgive us, gracious God. In Christ, stoop down to save us. Loosen the ties that bind us to sin and set us free to love and serve you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the good news of the gospel. As a voice from heaven said to Jesus, so God says to each of us, you are my beloved child, and with you I am well pleased. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Send down your Holy Spirit, O God. Tear open the veil of heaven and speak to us as beloved children, so that we may hear and believe the good news of your word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Lord today, thank you for joining us in worship. Dark times. As we look all around us in this season of COVID, it'd be easy to focus on the challenging news and see only the dark realities we face. In those dark times, the chance to blot out our horizon, we experience diminished hopes and discouraged faith. Tragically, the threat of COVID is compromised by the news of persons losing not only their health, but their jobs, their financial security, and even their lives. I just counted 20 snaps with my fingers. Time matters. Period of Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this past week, in America, we lost one person every 20 seconds. If our current situation doesn't change, we all might have to ask, <laughs> when will my 20 seconds be up? Yes, time matters. Throughout 2020, the year we just put to rest, as time passed, it seems we were waiting waiting for things to get better, waiting for our situation to improve, waiting for stimulus checks, waiting for an election to be over, waiting. And I want everyone to know that 
We even waited to see loved ones again, which many of us missed over the Christmas season. And I want to just speak to you today because in this midst of waiting, you might feel like you're weeping more tears than you ever thought possible. Maybe you dread facing another day, the day without the one that you love by your side any longer. Perhaps test results have <clears throat> come back positive and fear has taken up ownership of your heart and mind. Or, or perhaps your bank account just doesn't account for enough anymore to get you from month to month. If so, I want to assure and offer you threads of hope for our lives as we look for the bright side in a very dark time. The children of Israel <clears throat> faced a very similar situation as we find ourselves in today. That is the subject of our scripture passages that we'll read. So I ask that you please stand with me for the reading of scripture. There are three passages. They're taken from Jeremiah, Isaiah, and 1 Corinthians. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all who I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens, eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because as it prospers, you too will prosper. From Isaiah, when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. And then the Apostle Paul. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and knowledge, God confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who called you into his fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You may be seated. The children of Israel found themselves back in Jeremiah and the passage in Isaiah, captives in a strange line, you know, exiles from their home, uprooted, no anchor. Many began to doubt God's faithfulness. At a dark time in their nation, they were overwhelmed to the point where even they were losing their faith in God. In a similar way today, we may feel like this plague we are enduring through COVID is our own Babylon, our own captivity. And, and it's in those seasons that our sense of loss and discouragement can, can run high. And we may ask, is hope even a possibility well, through that prophet Isaiah and then through Paul in the New Testament, God spoke and, and their theme in that dark, hard times of life is God's steadfast faithfulness, his rock solidness for us, to those who wait upon him and the assurance of hope for those who have their faith in him. That's what we all need in a dark time. These biblical writers speak of God's timeless truth, and that message is this, still very relevant. The power and presence of God's peace is not diminished by our own personal crisis. In fact, 
Scripture tells us that during those times of crisis, when life seems to be spiraling in directions that we would never willingly choose for ourselves, that God makes his manifest peace most present. We can present our needs to him, and he imparts his presence, his love, his sustaining grace, his peace. So while we wait for the vaccine to take effect, and while we wait for life to return to some sense of normalcy, and while we wait for our fears to be relieved, who or where is our source of hope? Should we throw in the towel when those times are darkest? Should we just put our lives in limbo while we wait for signs that things might improve? What if they don't improve? Do we get a pass to abandon our faith? What do we hang on to when all the ground around us seems to be shifting sand or when the darkness seems to envelop us? How do we wait and not lose hope? Under no circumstances, dear church, do I want you to feel like I'm trivializing the crisis that you may be enduring right now or the depth of pain or loss or discouragement that you may be very real-time feeling. No, the exact opposite is true. The God of the Bible recognizes the suffering of his children. He grieves over our broken lives and crushed hopes. He doesn't avoid it or stick his head in the sand. He takes our pain on personally in the coming of Christ. And he says that even the obstacle of death and that sense of finality is not really the final word. God has the final word. No, it never helps our spirits to grow in Christ if we don't carry our overwhelming, painful burdens to Him. Please know that He hears us, that we have an advocate, our Savior, Christ Jesus, speaking for us before the throne of God. I believe that we can look for answers to find this hope and to nurture that hope in our text today. And I want to suggest that there's one thing we need to grab onto with both of our hands as we go through 2021, and that's trusting in God's faithfulness despite our circumstances. In our text today, God's faithfulness is expressed in a number of ways. I'm going to share the scriptural version first, then I want to share a personal story, and then I want to share a story of one whom you all know who's no longer with us, but her testimony inspires. So it's expressed to the Corinthians, um, a church, by the way, that like under many of us today, had experienced massive discouragement, persecution, crippling internal jealousies and divisions, a multitude of different leaders, and false teaching. They were trafficking in sin, and they were in complete disarray at a breaking point. How could their hope be restored? Paul uses word pictures, and you all know that I love word pictures, to tell the Corinthians that God's faithfulness is rooted in grace. We need not fear, despite our outward circumstances, that God is holding something back from us. No, Paul affirms to them and to us today that in Christ Jesus, God's grace, his beauty, as we'll see in a moment, is given providentially, freely, and fully. And he reaffirms for everyone to know that this grace God gives is bountiful beyond our wildest imagination. To do so, he uses a singular word picture. He uses the word enriched. The word harkens under the idea of being made splendid, of being made beautiful beyond measure. Now, this is not a richness of things. No, it's a richness in a way that, that we need, not that we necessarily want. We want things. We want comfort. We want all sunshine and no darkness. 
We often struggle when we don't get those things or when life doesn't look like that, like right now. In the natural order, it's a frequent thing for people to choose the path of least resistance. But in God's order, when the path is hard and long and relentless, he comes to walk with us through it. Paul has a great truth to share with the Corinthians and with us today, that God is more concerned with the character of our souls than with the lavishness of our lives or the comfort of our lives. He uses language in the text to change their perspective in the midst of the challenge. He pulls the curtain back, so to speak, as if to reveal a ministry and affirm that the promises and gifts of God are there not for us to get, but for us to become. I'll say that again. Paul is telling the Corinthians, and by essence us, the gifts and the grace of God is not there for us to get, but for us to become. The way the word is used in our passage, enriched. Paul is telling them by inference that in the past, through the cross and resurrection of Jesus, God acted lavishly to pour out his grace, his beauty, that action of pouring out his beauty was still active today, Paul says. Meaning, while they waited for their external situation to change, to move on, for their church to grow strong again, they didn't have to wait for their spirits to be transformed, for their character to grow. And the word is expressed passively in the text. Simply put, the people in Corinth couldn't do anything to receive these gifts from God. They didn't have to wait till they cleaned up their act for God to be pouring out His beauty on them. They didn't have to do anything for God to faithfully, lavishly pour out His love, His peace, His gifts. God simply, because of who He is, loved to share His beauty and rooted it in the person of his son Jesus. It was all of God and none of man. And this beautiful grace of God that he's pouring out, Paul says, it's complete for us. We will lack no spiritual gift, Paul says. The barrel for grace that we received is not so we can feel better. Paul says it's so that we can serve one another so that we can serve others. God didn't impart grace so that we could be comfortable, dear church, but so that we could stand in the world and point to the voice and the wisdom and the grace of God. Well, you might ask, Mark, my situation's horrible. My personal crisis is so dark. I'm on spiritual fumes and I don't think I can make it another day. Mark, how can someone like me know this beautiful grace you've talked about? How can someone like me experience this internal beauty that Paul shared so explicitly when all I feel like is a horrible mess? Well, Paul shares that answer for us as well in the text. He leaves no stone unturned. In verse 9, he says that it can be known only through fellowship with Christ. It's as though God is inviting us in the midst of our crisis, not waiting for it to be over, but in the midst of our crisis to understand that He remains faithful to us and that He's calling for us to go deeper in relationship and fellowship with Him, to spend time with Him, to let our roots of faith flourish as they go deep. There's two practical ways that we can do this, and I'm going to share these stories with you as kind of a conclusion. The first is to reorient our focus. Here's what I mean by that. We tend when problems surround us, and we can't go anywhere without hearing about COVID. We tend when problems surround us to focus on the problem, don't we? God's word through Paul, through what went on with the 
Hebrew children in the Old Testament, God calls us to focus on Him. So I'm going to share a story from my youth, my earlier time in life, at a camp in Colorado that my family went to in the summer. And I was 14 years old. And there was a young man there. His name was Dave Gruen. He was one of the youth leaders. And, and there was a place called Long's Peak in Colorado. And it's not far from where we were camping. And he asked me one day, he goes, hey, do you want to go to the top? I want you to know, as a 14-year-old kid, I didn't understand what go to the top meant. This was a 14,000-foot mountain. Now, by the way, um, in Kansas City, we lived pretty much at sea level. Okay, we, we lived no, no, 14,000 feet, lots of height. Not only that, it's a 14 and a half mile trek from the base to the top. So I'm 14, it's 14,000 foot high, it's a 14 and a half mile trek to the top, and he convinces me I want to do this. And so we set out, and it's hot, and it's summer, and as we go up, the tree line starts to disappear. But before we get out of it, and by the way, as we had gone, he had told me several things that excited my heart. He said we might encounter wildlife on the track. Now, when he meant wildlife, I was thinking squirrels, chipmunks, rabbits, things that I you know, could see. He meant bears, particularly a certain kind of bear, a grizzly bear. Now, I never had experience with a bear. I didn't know what that meant. But he said, Mark, if it comes to something, you need to listen to me. Well, we're going, and I'm this young 14-year-old kid, and I've got all the energy, and I understand how long 14 and a half miles is. And so I'm running ahead of him often. And he's a young man, but he's not 14, and, and I get ahead of him. And as I'm going, we're not out of the tree line yet, so we were somewhere around, I would say, I want to say somewhere around 6,000 feet, maybe 6,500 feet up on this mountainside. I'm just cruising along, having the time of my life, knowing that I'm going to clear a out. I'm going to bag the top of this big giant peak. And I hear him say very loudly, Mark, stop. Well, I don't know why he's wanting me to do that. I'm not that far ahead of him. But I hear it again, Mark, stop. So I do what he says. He goes, don't move. I don't understand. I hadn't seen what he had seen. I didn't know the danger that he was physically looking at because I was just dipping along the trail. <clears throat> well, he goes, Mark, don't panic. Listen to every word I speak to you and do exactly as I say, exactly as I tell you to do. And so I'm stopped, and I'm beginning to wonder what in the world is he talking about. And then out of the corner of my eye, on the right side of my life, coming out of the tree line, I see a juvenile grizzly bear. Now, it's well up the path for me. I don't know how Dave saw it, and I didn't, but he did. I didn't. He detected it first, and he's warning me to be careful. He goes, Mark, very slowly, I want you to turn around and look at me. He goes, don't take your eyes off of me and don't stop listening to me. And so very slowly, as I'm stopped there in my tracks, I'm following the man who says he knows how to get me through this, and I turn around very slowly and I look straight into his face. And he's maybe 50 feet, 60 feet back behind me. And he says, Mark, without moving your body much, I want you to walk toward me. And he started doing something as I would walk. He put his arms out to the side like this, and he stood wide with his feet like this. And I thought, what a strange thing. He goes, don't pay attention to what I'm doing. You just come to my voice, come to my face, walk to me slowly, Gently, nothing around him. And as I would move, I would see him every so often do this and then do this, which didn't make any sense to me until I got to him and we got away and he told me what was going on. He was trying to make himself look big. So the bear's sense of smell is extremely intense. Sense of vision, not so much. 
So he was trying to make the bear, if the bear looked at us, see that we looked bigger than we actually were. Well, did the danger abate when his voice called to me to stop? No. As I turned around and was focused on him, did the danger go away? No. Was the danger still real and present? Yes. But you see, I, I had a different focus. I was no longer looking at the problem, the threat, the challenge, the disaster in making. I was looking at someone who said they had my safety in mind, my care in mind, and that they could get me through this. And so one of the things I want to call to us that the Apostle Paul would say is, quit looking at all of the morass of problems around and focus on God. It doesn't mean that the problems go away. It means that our focus is on God and not the problems. It's such an important thing to do as we embark on 2021 and every 20 seconds someone's life is in. We must focus on Him or we will fail. There's a second thing that we should do. Um, and by the way, we, we can either choose to focus on the challenge or we can focus on Him. I, I leave the decision to you. I can tell you where the Apostle Paul and where I would tell you to come down. By the way, lest you think, oh, Mark's just preaching. Yes, I am preaching to me. For you see, when I talk about this long, lingering, pursuing, incredibly difficult time, coming out of COVID, our son Matt has now been diagnosed with diabetes. Our health challenges in our family continue. Our health challenges in our family are not disappearing. Is God going to go with us through that? Can we continue to hope on Him? Our answer is yes. I encourage you to embrace that focus in your life as well. So know that I'm preaching to myself today as much as to you. Then there's a final thing that I think we can do practically, and that's focus on our choices. We can choose to give up, or we can choose to grow deep in fellowship with Christ, as the Apostle Paul calls us to. I call the name of a person whom everybody in here knows. You all grew up with her in this church. Her name's Lyra Lewis. Vi, as you know, worked with me at the YMCA for a number of years. Vi was one of those ladies who was a surrogate mother to me when my mother was not here. And every day that I came to the Y, Vi would see me and make a beeline for me. I didn't go to her. She came to me and she'd say, I need my hug today. And we would hug. Vi was an incredibly vibrant woman of faith, a diminutive woman of faith. She fell several times at the Y as her health began to fail. She had over time, as health really began to fail and um, uh, life was near end, she went into palliative care. And I, because, um, first of all, the hospital was right next to the Y, but because I loved Vi, I would go to see her often. Toward the end of Vi's life, she couldn't speak very clearly. You couldn't make out what she was saying. And, and so she had a board where she, you could come and look and she would point to the letters to spell words for us. And um, as I went to her one day, um, she said two very profound things to me about the choices that she's made at the end of her life. When she was frustrated because her health was failing, she was frustrated because life was hard, she was frustrated because she knew death was on the horizon, and this was not how she wanted to die. But she said two very important things to me by pointing out words. The first word that she spelled was home, H-O-M-E. She knew that she had an eternal home with her Heavenly Father, and she wanted me. She was trying to encourage me. I was in tears at her bedside. Here I go to pastoral ministry, and she is encouraging me, she who is dying. She whose life is failing. She whose life is ebbing away. She who barely weighed 65 pounds at the time. Who you could pick up as just this little rag doll. 
She was encouraging me and letting me know that through the difficult times, she had her eyes set on a home in heaven, and she knew with assurance God's faithfulness would get her there. The second word she spelled out for me was God. And I asked her the question, are you telling me that God is who your faith is in now? She just nodded her head once. I said, are you ready to meet your God? She nodded her head once. I want you to know when all of our life was falling apart and when all of our life was ending in a way that she would have never, ever, ever wanted. If you knew why, you know that. She wanted to be exuberant and she wanted to be larger in life even though she was diminutive and she was active and physical. She taught wellness well into her 90s. The woman was incredible. And as she was ending her life and the challenges were great, she couldn't control her body any longer. She couldn't speak any longer, and she couldn't move any longer. It had to be fed by and all down that cycle. She never lost her hope in God because she knew when she had her hope in God, despite the difficult circumstances, she had a home that was being prepared for her where she would go for eternity and live with Him. I want you to know that's Paul's answer to you and I. To focus not on the challenges, however great they may be, but to focus on Him and to recognize that He will carry us through to that eternal home that He has set for us. So while I can't promise you that the pain you're in, the journey you're on, will be quick or easy. I, I can, however, rest on the assurances and promises of God, and I can promise His presence and His comfort and His peace and His hope that rides the crashing waves of this life and brings us safe home. Yes, our hope is built on His unfailing solid love for us and he is faithful and he will carry us through.
We give not because we have to, we give because we choose to. The earth belongs to God, our Creator, and every good thing is a gift from the Lord. Let us glorify God through the gifts of our lives, through the giving of that which He has given us. Join me in prayer. We give you thanks, O oh God, for every blessing and spiritual gift that you have poured out upon us. For the gifts of our lives be a source of blessing in our world and to the glory of your holy name. Amen. I know as you're scattered about, not only here, but um, watching, I know that there are needs, not just related to COVID or to our ongoing wellness, but just to concerns that are within your family that might be spread out across the nation. I want us to carry those before the Lord at this moment. If you would join me, I'm going to provide a space at the early set here just for you to take a few seconds and voice your concerns, and then I'll join us in prayer. And we'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer together. Let's take some moments, just quietness before the Lord. Holy Father, we come for you in a spirit of trust, in a spirit of humble, faithful, loving devotion to you. And we admit that without you, we can do nothing. We admit that apart from you, the obstacles of life are just simply too great. We admit that our needs are so huge, we cannot resource them all. Only in you can we find the hope to take that next step in life to take that next step in faith, to make that, take that next step in grace. God, as people have voiced their concerns and needs before you, as they have brought their hurts and their wounds to you, as they have brought their concerns for their family and for our world to you, we ask you to be the loving God that you are and to faithfully minister as you see fit within your will to impact our lives for your kingdom. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your peace that passes any understanding offered by this world. And thank you for your resplendent grace, the beauty of your grace that's poured out into our lives freely by your hand. May we receive your blessings today and may we walk in your ways and may we follow you as you taught us to pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, to conclude our time of worship, let us go forth into the world with the peace of Christ as our banner, with the grace of God as our sure hope, and with his eyes to see the needs around us, to heal the hurting, and minister his love in his power. And may God's faithful blessing be upon us, and may his grace be with us always. Blessings to you.